for today's the afternoon meeting, May 4th, Fed Day. I am an associated member of T3 Trading Group, which is an SEC registered broker dealer and member of Finra Sipic. All trades placed by me are placed through T3 Trading Group. You should carefully consider whether trading is suitable for you in light of your own financial condition. We got the position disclosure. Let's go into charts. Oh my God. I should have gotten a beer for this afternoon meeting. I usually try to save the beers for after work is over. But on a day like today, it certainly feels justified, man. Woo! <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I'm gonna have to be committed into the loony bin if this uh, degree of volatility just, just stays this consistent like we've had for the first five months this year. It's because this is nuts, man. You almost can't even see the opening volatility that we dealt with this morning. Uh, <laughs> nice, Greg. Out, out, out in, in, in the spies. The spies were actually relatively stable compared to the other indices. Uh, but it was all about the market today. Um, Pat headed up the morning meeting because I had to uh, pick my, my dad up. Uh, my dad flew in last night real late with a, with a friend of his. They're both out here for the week. Um, they landed real late in Idaho Falls, so I had to drive and pick them up. Uh, so, so we had Pat running the show this morning, and he did a great job like he always does. Uh, but there wasn't really too, too much to talk about, I guess, in the morning meeting today because we were primarily in wait-and-see mode to see what happens at 2 o'clock with the big, bad Fed meeting. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've, we've just spent so much time talking about this. Uh, we have the Fed meeting today. Everyone knows it's going to be a 50 basis point hike. There's going to be no surprise there. Everyone is looking to language on the balance sheet runoff, but that has already been informed to the market at $95 billion. Uh, so those expectations were entirely perfectly met. Almost everything was perfectly met. And um, my thought process, the execution of this thought process turned out to be very difficult, but my thought process was, just because I've seen this happen a lot, especially when you're dealing with market sentiment that's as bearish as, as it is and all the positioning sentiment information that we have, is that if the Fed just meets expectations, we have to remember that the market's a forward-looking mechanism, if the Fed is able to just meet expectations, then this market has the potential to really move higher, not because anything new that's better happened, but just because we get a risk event out of the way, the market doesn't like uncertainty, it's able to take a deep breath here that it's done. On top of that, there was, I honestly wouldn't even really call it that dovish, not compared to what my personal expectations were. I had been really surprised that the Fed, or sorry, that the Fed funds market, Fed funds futures, had been pricing in such a high probability of a 75 uh, basis point hike. And I know that a lot of that is off of language that actually created this last down move here, which came from Fed members about how, you know, 75 basis points is possible. Oh, maybe even 100 basis points is possible. I personally think, as everybody here knows, never thought that that was going to happen. Like things would have to be like, the only way that that happens is if, is if the inflation numbers actually continue to get significantly, significantly worse. And I have been of the thought process that um, inflation is at least a near-term peak, and that's just kind of based off of uh, off of data and logic that we have explored here in in the past in the virtual trading floor. So I'm not going to get into it too too much. And I think, and the, look, you got to give these guys in the Fed the credit that they deserve. We're talking about some really smart people here. Are they able to make mistakes? Of course, they they could make a they could make a policy mistake, but they know the power of their words. They know that their words alone, we keep talking about this, has the potential to move markets. Uh, I think that they know that time is on their side because what they can control is they can control demand to a certain degree by creating a recession and by crashing the stock market like they've been doing. They can't control supply. 
But I, I still think, and I, I don't want to use the word transitory, but I still think that the supply side of infl that, that's created inflation is going to be able to come back online at a certain point. And that's just because we live in a capitalist world at this point. Even beyond America, I know that there's varying degrees of it, but even if you look at a communist country like China, they've, in, they've embraced capitalism. They want to be making money, right? Uh, you know, whatever, they've got their policy on COVID, and, and my biggest fear recently has been the resurgence of COVID in China potentially slowing down what I thought was going to be a normalization of the supply side of, of economics. Um, that is what's really needed to be able to bring inflation back down. But it's going to happen. I mean, you, you just look at these people who are buying houses right now compared to buying them a year ago. If you're buying the average house, which is like $500,000, you're paying $1,000 more a month for that. Well, if you're paying $1,000 more a month, you're not spending that $1,000 on whatever stuff that it, it, it is creating the inflation. So I think that they know the time is on their side. They want to create some demand destruction. They want to see the numbers go down. I actually thought one of the most interesting things about the Fed today was when Powell said that maybe we just kind of see inflation flatline a little bit up here, like not necessarily peak and come straight down, not necessarily have a big upside continuation, but maybe like flatline and dribble lower. And I actually thought that that was a really interesting comment because I, I hadn't actually thought about that possibility which is a mistake because I'm the one who always talks about with the stock market, how everyone always chooses higher or lower and people don't choose sideways. I've been saying all year, why can't it just be possible that we just have a bigger, broader sideways market with a ton of volatility? And in a lot of ways, that's really what's happened. Like if you just start at the midpoint of, you know, if we get back to 440 in the spies, we're just right back on the midpoint of things. Now we're closer to the lower end of what's been a, a big range this year. So we've been sideways to down on the year. Why can't inflation end up being sideways also? Why can't it be sideways to slowly working its way back down? And um, my concern has been that the Fed could make a policy mistake on tightening too quickly, but I kind of think that they're a little bit too smart for that. Maybe I'm giving them more credit than they're due. But uh, you know, the one thing that Powell said that really helped rally the market he basically said 75 basis points was off the table for the next hike, but they can continue to increase that 50 as necessary. But but the market was already pricing in, I think I, I saw at one, chan one point a 90% probability of a 75% basis point hike at some point in the last two weeks. I think that that was getting priced in for the next meeting. And that's basically out the window. So it's looking like it's going to be 50 and that turned into being the one really bullish comment. But it's, it, personally, it's what I've been expecting the entire time. But um, I guess the market wasn't expecting it. And it really helped to, to lead to this rally. So give myself some credit where credit's due. And then I'm going to not give myself credit where credit's not due. At the end of the day here, I was right about what I thought was going to happen. And the market reacted more or less as I thought it was going to happen just by getting this out of the way. I really thought, and, and, I, and I typed this in when Pat was doing the morning meeting, I really thought that we would resolve higher here unless they said something new that was majorly hawkish. And I didn't think that that was going to happen. So we did get this resolution to the upside. But uh, to then take credit away from me, the execution was so hard. The execution here was so hard. Um, and I, I don't think I did a good job either executing this for myself, to be honest, to make more money off of this, or communicating to you guys how you could have executed this for yourself better. And uh, honestly, part of the reason for that is because there was never really too much of a trade setup. The, the best trade, up, trade setup, I think, is when Chris J mentioned it, just the buy through 420 here when we were breaking this high. Um, Josh did a pretty good job of letting us know his thought price process on, on the price action, like initial move higher, then real move is looking like it's going to be lower. And he said when we were actually breaking down, I think he actually said it here when we were having this second bounce, but we didn't break the high. If the market's able to break the high, then we could totally explode and be off to the races. And that could have been your buy point. And I, and I kept talking about how if we break, once this pivot happened and we made new lows, if we can break this pivot, 
it could be back to long territory, but I didn't communicate buying through 419. I didn't communicate buying through 420. And that's probably your only real buy setups, honestly, in, in the entirety of this move. And I, it was very tricky. It was very tricky to execute that. It was very tricky to communicate it because the price action was so sloppy between two o'clock and when he actually said those comments at 2.30, this price action was brutally sloppy in here because you know, I, I try to communicate two major things. Um, I, I, I try to communicate information and I try to communicate trades and, and it's not easy. Um, information is really important because information influences trades and trades are really important because trades are how you, you know, you buy and sell to, to, to actually execute to be able to make money. So I'm doing my best to communicate the information. Right? And the information is based off of previous pivots. A lot of times, so when you're dealing with any news event, the initial reaction, the opposite side of the initial reaction is, is always going to be uh, really important. So if the initial reaction was higher, like it was at 2 o'clock, your first important downside spot is going to be the low of that initial reaction. So initially we trade up. You know, 416.95 is that low, and we communicated that. So that's the low for the, the spies, you know, low for the Qs, we communicated that price, it's 318.82, low for the IWM, etc. That's what you want to pay attention to. So as long as we are above the opening low, and this is information, not a trade, we're, we're bullish, which means that generally you want to be looking for trades to the long side. But if this low breaks, what does that mean? It means that all these people, all this volume becomes out of the money. And when people are out of the money, that can lead to a resolution to the downside. So we broke that low, but we didn't actually get momentum to the downside, which was interesting. We got this wackadoo inside bar here where we just weren't resolving anyway. We did communicate that you could try, and I didn't have conviction on this one either. So that's why I said um, uh, you could take this in either direction, but I wouldn't take it on size. You could try the break of this inside bar long. You could try the uh, <laughs> rich. We, we could try the break of this inside bar to the downside here. It did break down. I don't know if anybody took that trade. It tended to. It really was not a great trade, which is kind of what I thought. Um, but hopefully, you at least got your risk covered. So now we're breaking down. We're making this pivot low, and then we start to break back up. And I'm like, okay, we're back above our starting point here. Things are looking bullish. So we went from. This is literally what happened. We, the information was bullish, the information was bearish, the information was bullish, the information was bearish, okay, the information is bullish. That's literally how, how, how it went down. And that's ruthlessly difficult to be able to execute. But, you know, again, you know your key spots. You know this opening low is key, and then you know that this last pivot high is going to be really important. And that's where your only potential trade was, and I... And I I failed to be able to communicate this trade properly in real time, and I failed to execute it for myself in real time. But your opportunities to actually really be able to get long here, if you were willing to take the risk, because the risk on the trade wasn't cheap, the opportunities to actually get long were basically the break of this pivot high, which negated this, this high volume negative Marabozu. So this basically has the opposite effect of what I was just talking about. So we know that on this bar, if we get below it, everyone who bought is out of the money that can lead to selling on this bar, look at this heavy volume sell bar here at 230. If that high breaks, all of these short sellers are out of the money and you could potentially get a squeeze. We also know the importance of 420 as a key bigger picture technical level because we've spoken about it enough. That was your chance to be able to execute. It was through 4, 419 in this pivot and through 420. And then honestly, into this up move, I don't see any any execution in here at all except for maybe this inside five and up off momentum. One thing that we were able to communicate really well, though I think it was a bit late on the call out, it's not helping you if you're not already long. One thing that we did communicate well was that if you are long, if you were able to get any, sure, go ahead, book a little bit into upside extension, but keep some stock because we know the market dynamics right now, because we've spoken to spoken about them so much. Pat's note is constantly reporting on it. We know that there's like no one except Stefan who's long this market. Um, the, the funds are hedged, they're short, they're in cash. The retail money, 
We saw that data that came out of Interactive Brokers a week or so ago. They're in cash. They're more short than they've ever been. We, we know that there's not a lot of liquidity. We know that gamma is negative. Therefore, we know that if price begins to break to the upside, those hedges have to get unwound. The dealers have to unwind their hedges. Uh, if, if the VIX comes down, you've got the vol control bid, which is pretty much out of the market right now that begins to, to potentially come into the market that's even more buying. And at a, at a certain point, you might even get funds and retail money that goes, oh my God, I'm sitting in cash and I'm missing the move when I need to start buying also. So, and, and that's the same market dynamics that created this move here. I'm not saying that this is day one of a repeat of what we saw in the second half of March. I will say just because of market dynamics, it is possible. It's definitely possible. The more that we go up here, if we start really clearing, like we stopped at 430 resistance, we stopped at the 21 EMA. So at the end of the day here, our technicals are still bearish. Let's, let's get that straight. Our technicals are still bearish. We still are below resistance. We're only at the upper band of, of, of equilibrium. We didn't have a trend change here. We did have this, this uh, hammer doji a couple days ago, but all that means is a move back into equilibrium. We have not confirmed any sort of reversal in this market. I'm not coming in still and saying that this is the bottom. I, I, I will probably never do that, even if it is the bottom. Um, but this is a heck of a day one. And if we do get some follow through tomorrow, it is very typical that the day after a Fed day is a trend day where a lot of institutions, they, they need time to do research and to digest the information and to figure out how they want to position themselves. They're not scrambling to buy the market today. They may come in and begin to buy the market tomorrow or sell the market tomorrow, which is why the day after a Fed day is often, but not always, a trend day. So if, and I love to think about if-then statements, if the spies do start clearing 430, get above the 21 EMA, if we get confirmations of an actual reversal happening, right now it's just, just a retracement, not a reversal. But if we get more of a confirmation of a reversal actually happening, those market dynamics are in place where it is realistic to see a repeat of what we saw in the second half of March. I don't want to come here and predict it, but I want to make sure that I can make money off of it actually, if it actually happens by having rules in place for which retracements can become reversals. So um, at the end of the day here, I really hope that some of you guys were able to nab this, this market today to the long side. I know that it was super difficult. I ended up posting pretty good P&L for myself, but it's relative. Like I had a good day today. Today almost should have, and, and should have is a not a thing you should say in trading. It should have been a monster day for me today. It wasn't. It was just uh, it was a pretty good day, not a monster day. And and that's all because I failed to be able to properly execute on these breaks myself, which you know is what it is. Um, so I do hope that some of you guys are able to capture this rally. I do hope that some of you guys have stock from good prices and that you're swinging it and you're in win-win situations. Because if you have that in hand, then you have a system in place where you can follow rules, where in a, let's still call it lower probability situation, in a lower probability situation that we see a repeat of the second half of March, you can be able to capture that if we're seeing spies back at 450 by you know the end, the end of May. Um, and no problem, John, hope you crushed it. And uh, it, it could, could happen. You know, the volatility in this market has been insane. And, and like I have been saying, I, I said it on Monday this week, I think that this price action that we started seeing in the second half of April is more of a late is more of late stage bear market than it is early stage bear market, to be honest. You know, we started with the growth stocks puking first, right? We started by having a bear market in the NASDAQ and the Russell, but with be there being constant uh, money rotation that was going on. Um, where you always had one sector that was able to hold up and the spies were always able to hold up a little bit better because there was the, the benefactor of, of money rotation. And then all of a sudden we had this false breakout and we had one, two, three, four, all four of these negative Marabozu days, I think were days where every single sector in the market was red. And we haven't really seen that in 2022 too much until this period of time. Uh, so we'll see. 
we'll, we'll, we'll see what kind of follow through we get on it. And, and that's basically it. Um, I really don't have too much to talk about as far as individual stocks go. There wasn't much that was on my personal radar this morning as far as individual stocks go. Um, because one, I was late with my research and, and two, because I was really just, I was in wait and see all day on this market. And by the way, <laughs> I know I'm only talking about post two o'clock because that's when things happened here. But this price action pre two o'clock for a Fed day was also nuts. This is not really how it's supposed to work on Fed days pre two o'clock. It's more supposed to be like what we saw from the spies yesterday in the morning like just tight choppy everyone's waiting for the fed today we just we had this insane insane volatility even before the fed hit which i guess is par for the course on this market but i was like oh my god and, and it's funny because in hindsight this move was so big that doesn't even look like too much happened here but this is a massive move we went from 319.50 to a midday low at, at below 314 this is this is a five and a half dollar downside move for the NASDAQ that then gave a 100% upside retracement all before two o'clock. Nuts. And I was saying when the queues were at 315, I was like, guys, I know we're weak right now. I know things are looking pretty bad. Like, I mean, that biotech ETF was so bad this morning. Growth was so, look at this biotech ETF just like getting destroyed. I'm like, where is this selling coming from at Fed Day pre two o'clock? Uh, growth was getting destroyed, but biotech was getting destroyed. Things were just, a lot of things were just not trading well. Energy, of course, holding in without a problem like always. Um, uh, but the, the movements here early on were just, uh, I don't even know. They were, they were just, they were just kind of, kind of nuts. And I said here at 3.15 in the queues, I was like, guys, I know things are looking bad right now, but post Fed meeting, we could be at 325 or or 305, like $10 up or down. Not only did we get to 325, we got to 330. This move lower was ruthless also between 2 and 2 and 330. And it almost looks like a blip in the radar compared to what happened. But this we upticked to 322 and then downticked to 315. In 30 minutes and then flip the switch to go from 315 to 330 oh my god I, I, I need I need I need uh, I need to be committed <laughs> it's just uh, it's wild it's wild I, I the volatility this year has just been so insane and so consistent that's that's been the biggest thing is I've seen periods of really big volatility if you traded COVID COVID was still even crazier than this. You know, it's the only time I've ever seen in my career the, the whole market get halted. And some days it was at the open. At the market open, there was that one day during COVID where the market opened and like halted immediately. I, <laughs> so in that regard, that period of time was still crazy, but without, it didn't last. This, is, this has been, we're working towards six months of this type of price action right now. Just sick. Um. Yeah, Diego saying uh, even in 08 it would last two three weeks, calm down and then trend. Yeah, just uh, all over the place, and and you can you can see how low. You know, if you've been looking at, at tape and stock for a long time, you can just see the lack of liquidity in the tape. That is helping to contribute to to this degree of volatility right now. It's uh, and that's also though the exact same additional market dynamics that can create the move that we saw in the second half of March and potentially, you know, under normal market circumstances, if when we had this move here to like 324 in the queues that I still have up, I'd be like, guys, you got to be book that profit, book that profit. We're insanely extended. Today I'm like, yeah, we're pretty extended. Maybe you should take a little bit off, but keep some because we could definitely keep going. And then and, and that's what happened because that's just adjusting to the new normal of the market. But I know it's tricky because, uh, and I know someone was asking about this in the VTF earlier today. Someone was like, I keep shorting and we're in a bear market and I keep not making money because I get pushed out. If you got to be able to give things space. Like even if you took those buys today through, you know, for the queues, it'd be through 320, this pivot or through basically highs like 322. 
if you're buying the Qs through 320 here when we actually went, you had to give this $3 of space. So that's a lot of room to, to really trade it right. If you were not giving the Qs $3 of space here, honestly, in this case, you probably made money. But you're the trader who's probably getting shaken out and still having your ideas work. Because you, the, the liquidity is so low, the volatility is so big, it's, it's, and this sucks if you're a new trader, I'm sorry. Because if you're a new trader, you're not working with like a big account, and you're looking at this, and you're like, oh man, you know, I really wish I could, I, I don't want to ever risk more than, you know, like a hundred or two hundred dollars in a trade because I'm new and I'm a smaller account and I'm trying to learn. Well, I mean, that means that on this trade, you can't even take a hundred shares, so, and that, and that, and that's just so hard. So. Volatility, when it, when it comes to the maximum benefit for traders in regards to volatility, it's really a happy medium. I've traded market environments, which right now in this moment, it might seem like a relief for us to get this type of environment again, but I promise you it's not. I've traded market environments where the VIX is at like 12. There's no volatility. And it, yeah, you're taking a ton of tier size on the trades that show up, but you're just not getting follow through on things. And that's not great for us. This environment is the opposite. It's so much volatility. It requires so much space risk for your trades to not get shaken out of things that you just can't take like enough size to then be able to game plan things properly. We want a happy medium. A fix in the low 20s would be like, like very nice where we're still getting movement to get paid, but you can actually take the trades because the risk is appropriate. Um, and, and that's... Uh, yeah, exactly, Diego. And this is we're talking I'm talking about five minute bars right now. I'm not even talking about trading a fifteen minute candle. We're talking about five minute candles. And I still don't like trading two minute bars. You might say to yourself, Oh, well what if I look at a two minute bar? I still think a two minute bar is just a recipe to get chicken out of things. I think that the time frame is too small, the information is too small, and um, it, it it doesn't really do you any favors on that time frame. So that's it. That's that's all I got to talk about. It was all about the market today, all about the Fed, and um, I haven't answered any, any questions that you guys have. Let me scroll up in the VTF here and look for questions. Greg, man, send me one of them as gooses over to Idaho, please. Uh, first thing I'm seeing here is from Dat1. Uh, could you have bought when it broke above the 230 candle? Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was talking about. The break of the 230 candle. The, those, and I'll go back to the spies. The, the, the opportunities to buy here were the break of the first high and the break of the 230 candle. That, that, that's exactly it. Those are the only real good trades I see here. And again, like I was just saying, then it becomes about the risk. Because if you did it in the spies, if you bought the break of that candle, you really got to give it to the low of that candle. So you're you're looking at buying, you know, whatever, 41940 with a stop loss at 416 or so. You know, you are taking almost three and a half dollars worth of risk on that. It's uh it's not easy. And obviously you can look at your individual stocks, you know. We look at the market, but we trade the stocks. So I'm sure you could have found stocks where, all right, I wanna be long, but I'm not buying the spies because it's too crazy. Let me buy this stock or that stock. And ideally you're looking at things that are relatively strong. And what was relatively strong today? was energy like if you bought the XLE here you know this could have been a little bit more appropriate uh, or anything else that was that was showing relative strength and so that's what and that's a lot of what our process breakdown is right we're digesting the information especially on a day like today because for the most part everything is going to be moving with the market there's going to be certain things that are going to have aspects of relative strength there's going to be certain things that have aspect of relative weakness generally if the market says buy, you want to look for a stock or a sector that's relatively strong and buy that. If the market says sell, you generally want to be looking for a stock or a sector that's relatively weak and, and sell or short that. Um, so, so you know, broadly, that was the market, and then you could have gone to individual stocks. And again, that's just where, you know, I'm, I'm a little upset at myself because I didn't think that I did a good job communicating these key buy spots here with the market. I didn't do it for myself. And uh, I didn't do a good job of then recognizing this information 
and then finding the actual stocks that we should be looking at as a team to actually buy. Uh, so I, 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 I take the fault on that one on my shoulders. Uh, from YH here, how it increased the rate affect the market? Well, you saw it. <laughs> the, in the increase in the rate brought the market up. Sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? Well, it is, it is a little bit counterintuitive, right? Technically, higher interest rates mean that multiples should be contracting, which means that markets should be going down, particularly uh, anything that is long duration growth related. And, um, and uh, maybe you get some relative strength out of value type stocks. That's your first level thinking. Your second level thinking needs to be how much of this is priced in? Is it overpriced in? And my thought process, as I think you guys have been aware, is that this actually has been overpriced in. I think that the market has been overpricing in these Fed hikes. So if it's already fully priced in and things meet expectations or even slightly better than expectations, even though it's an increase in, in the rate, the market can react very bullish on that. And that is, that's exactly what happened. Uh, from Robert Gillenwater, can you break down the SoFi trade today? I don't know what, what I still don't know what woke SoFi up this way. I actually think that the better trade was not SoFi, it was Upstart. Um, and, and I and when this was breaking, I actually thought this was breaking higher because of Upstart. So so we saw and we communicated again, understanding relative strength, uh, this this pattern in here in Upstart this morning. This was my favorite idea of the day today that we were able to find intraday. I don't know if anybody took it because you were all worried about fighting the market, which is totally, totally understandable because I was worried about it too. But this pattern is just so great. Look at the relative strength here. So, so Upstart we consider to be a growth stock. It broke out at 1025 today. But look at how it traded prior to 1025 and then type up almost any other growth stock. Let's just look at ARC. Let's look at what ARC did between 930 and 1025, and then let's care, compare it to Upstart. Look at what ARC is doing from 930 to 1025. Finally stabilizes a little bit at 1025. It's just straight down. Was it down like 5%? I, I think it was down like 5% at lows here today. Look at what Upstart's doing. This is the definition of relative strength. Upstart's giving you a, a bullish pennant that's being built out. This is the trade that I really liked. Very clear intraday resistance at $88. Worried about fighting the market. Would have loved this trade if the, you know, look at what the Qs are doing. I'm just like, if the Qs just keep downtrending, and we have had days, we have had days where the market has just trended down all day. This could have been one of those days. We could have just trended down to 2 o'clock. Two o'clock, we could have been at 3:08 in the queues, and then caught our bid and all the volatility and everything that happened. So as great as this upstart trade looked, the relative strength was extremely notable. The thing that was against it was the market. So people didn't take this trade because they're like, "Hey, I don't want to fight the market. It's a Fed day. It's 11 o'clock. I don't. I don't want to do a lot of trading right now." That is, I get it. That's fine, and I I, I commend the thought process. To be honest. You recognized a layer of probability that was against the success of the trade and decided not to put the risk on as a result. I got no problem with that. The flip side of that is you got a, a bullish chart pattern in a relatively strong stock, which is a layer of probability for it. So this is the trade that I really like. The SoFi trade, I don't know what happened with SoFi where this volume woke up. I don't even really see a trade in here, to be totally honest with you. The only thing that I noticed about SoFi, and I watched this stock very closely because I've been trading it a lot and very consistently now for, for, for quite some time, um, is that this was actually also acting relatively strong. It was acting relatively strong e even even in here. It was negative. It wasn't as strong as Upstart was, but it was, it was acting much better than most growth stocks. The only other growth stocks that were looking good this morning were Pinterest, which we discussed as a team. And that ended up being a good trade if anybody talk, uh, took it. And Robinhood was also acting really strong today. And uh, this one was probably not as good of a trade. Um, 
pins was really nice. If anybody, I mean, we, this relative strength here, just, you, had, you had to find a way to be able to execute. Uh, SoFi was actually also showing relative strength here. And then it woke up, the volume came in, and it looked like it was just playing catch up to upstart to me, to be honest. So I didn't see anything here that, that got me super excited to do a lot of new execution. It's just a name that I've kind of, kind of, uh, kind of been involved in for a while. And then it cleared up on some key levels here. Look, this thing adjusted their earnings report back here on the 7th entirely because of the student loan thing here. Um, and rightfully, the stock went down on it. But the stock has just continued to go straight down from 8 to 6 since then. That's a huge difference on a percentage basis in a company that hasn't had anything change since then. And I actually think based on my research that this is a company that has the ability to be really successful and will be profitable in the relatively near future, which makes it not as long of a duration asset as maybe some of the other growth stocks that I do honestly think are a lot of them probably worth zeros. I don't think that this is a zero. I think this is a very real business going on. The growth that this company has been implementing has been insane. Um, and they have a path to profitability, and that profitability is relatively close. But the technicals have just been garbage. They've been, and 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 Pat said it great this morning when he was kind of comparing Pinterest, I think, and Peloton, and another one. And honestly, I don't hate this Peloton either at this area because I think it's a buyout candidate. But he was like, Pinterest is EPS positive. Like this is a company that actually makes money, and they've just gotten wrecked the way that they have. Like. A lot of these companies, and, and we discussed this earlier in the week because we started to see some relative strength with them, I think that we've hit the point here when you've got these companies that are down 75 to 90% where they kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater on some of them, and we've hit a point where if you're a stock picker that you can pull out the ones that are more legitimate, that have a path to profitability, that are going to be real companies that we're going to know still in 10 years from, from the ones that are fly-by-night BS companies that spacked or whatever and are, are, are worthless and they're going to be nothing. And, uh, I, you know, I, I know I'm not directly answering your question at this point, but I think that, that SoFi is one of these companies that, that's a real company that's here to stay. I think Pinterest is one of those companies that's a real company that, that, that's here to stay. Um, but, the, but the technicals on this have just been awful. You know, stock is dropping like 50% a month, just like all the rest of them. So, I don't know. Maybe it just kind of hit that time here where upstart's relatively strong and this thing just got squeezed out a little bit. Somebody bought, I can tell you that. There's big volume coming in. I don't know if that was a short just saying, you know what, I crushed it, I'm out, or if that was a long saying, you know what, this thing's hit that point where I'm ready to start accumulating a position. I really can't tell you. Uh, but it's for now, it's just a snap back to the 21 EMA, so, so we'll see. But again, to directly answer your question, I don't really see a great trade in here outside of recognizing the volume, saying something's going on, and buying versus a volume bar low. Like if you just bought on this candle versus this low, that could, that could be a trade. I don't want to take that without seeing news hit, though. And I never saw any news hit. So, I don't know. I don't, I, I par, probably part of the other reason why this thing is continuing to get wrecked is that chatter about student loan forgiveness. I don't think that's gonna happen. I, I, I've said that also. It's just, it's just not, it's not popular. It's not even popular among Democrats. It's just not popular. Um, I don't. I just don't think it's going to be done. And at a certain point, probably especially if you did get, you know, a shift towards. Uh, and, and again, I don't want to talk about good or bad when it comes to politics. I want to talk about how we're going to make money. Um, but I think that like a Republican administration is going to be more apt to even end the moratorium on student loan stuff happening uh, which would give a boost to this company but what I've been saying about SoFi is that they're wrecking this thing on the student loan stuff that was originally this company's only business it's not their only business anymore they, they have a bank charter now the company has expanded into other areas of, of banking and that's going to just uh, continue to happen and they're picking up all these younger people. And honestly, they should be picking up anybody who just does their research. Because like I told you guys like a couple of days ago, 
I am very unhappy with the Citizens Bank that bought out the uh, HSBC in the United States, and I'm looking for a new bank, and I'm wondering what bank I'm going to take. And I did some real research over the weekend on SoFi, one because I traded a lot, and two, you know, I asked myself, I was like, if I'm if I'm going to continue to trade this thing as much and as act as actively as I've been trading it, I need to look at the product for myself. And say that this is a product that I would use. I looked at the product for myself. This is a product that I would use. Um, there's actually a lot of things I like. I, I, I like about it. I just got to get off my lazy butt and actually make some some changes occur here. So uh, I still have this one on the radar. I'm still going to be trading it actively, and and uh, you know we'll see see how it all plays out. Um, from Steve, do you see any? Uh, Technical signals that hinted AMD moving up starting at 11:45 today. This AMD was also tough. Um, so this is another one. What did, and what did Airbnb do today? <laughs> I thought that both AMD and Airbnb had great numbers, and it's just a sign of this market that they sold these things off at the open the way that they did. They sold this thing off from $98 down to $91 here. And the two trades I would have considered taking in this thing both failed. I would have looked at this trade, but I would have been nervous because the ADMA hadn't caught up yet. And this trade right here actually would have really, would have really liked for a, for a, for a bounce back trade, um, bounce back to you know ninety five fifty or something like that, and then take kind of take it from their situation. And both of those things would have failed. You know, this is like a fifteen minute correction here, it's trying to make a doji on the five minute. You can see it even did try to pivot, peak popped a little bit, and then totally failed. I don't see anything here midday. I, I, personally, I wouldn't even have been looking at it midday. If I if I tried it on those couple of occasions and it failed, and now it's post 1030 and this thing is still trending down and it's filling the gap, I don't even think I would have been looking at this thing midday for when it actually caught a bid. And, and I see no signal in here that could have gotten me excited either. Certainly not on a 5, and certainly not on a 15. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, it was probably just the market. From Robert, Apple 305 hammer continuation at 164. Yeah, I would call this like a bull flag, honestly. Bull flag with an inside bar at the end. Um, and then and then gives continuation off that setup. Yeah, I, I like this trade. I like this trade, Robert. I, I like it a lot. Um, really good stuff. Acting strong above the levels. Market now is above its key levels. Building out a bullish consolidation. Let's the ADMA catch up. Um, ending with an inside bar. This becomes your execution and gives fantastic follow through. This this is a great a great setup. Really good setup. Uh, from Ben here. I wasn't around for the midday low. Were you talking about buying? No, I was talking about doing nothing. At lows of the day today, I was just talking about doing nothing. Um, waiting. Waiting for 2 o'clock. From Josh, uh, Art Cashin's words of wisdom couldn't be more meaningful than today. Never been on the end of the world because it only happens once. Josh also saying, many have been asking me recently how to keep a journal. If you go to the room drive folder, there should be a document there that's a journal template. I also have a class in my training program about journaling that you can look at. Uh, and since I'm making announcements, this reminds me of um, two announcements. One, I want to repeat an announcement that I said earlier. There's a fake Instagram out there. It's a... Uh, it's uh, T3 trading with an underscore at the end. The real Instagram is just T3 trading. So there's a scammer out there that made a fake Instagram that then stole all of our posts. And he was, or she, or whatever, was DMing me and uh, is saying, like, uh, do you want your net worth to be over $600,000 in 90 days? Create a, a, a an account on my recommended brokerage system, d deposit money. I'll trade it for you. 
and then I'll let you know when you can withdraw the profits. That'll be in two weeks. Uh, so be very careful about that. It's fake. Don't follow it. Don't add it. Don't let it follow you. Um, it's not real. Uh, the other announcement I wanted to make is I found a good podcast. I've been I've been looking for a podcast that I've liked, a tr- market relating podcast for a while, and I listened to a bunch and I've been on a bunch and um, I haven't found one in a while that I wanted to be a regular listener to, and I, and I found one here that I think is actually pretty good. It's called Trading Justice, Trading Justice. And, I, and they actually, the reason, the only way that I found them, and, and it looks like they got five stars and they get a lot of, a lot of listens here. Um, the way that I found them is that they asked me to be a guest. So I started listening to a few of them because I wanted to have an understanding of kind of what they're about. And I was like, oh, these guys, uh, they don't agree with everything that they say, but I, I really like, I really like what these guys are talking about. So I did that. Um, I was a podcast guest for them yesterday, but they told me that, that my whatever uh, guest part of the podcast probably isn't going to be on until, for like three or four more weeks. But regardless of me being a guest on it or not, um, I, I, I recommend for traders to listen to it. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty good one. Pretty good one. Uh, anyway, those are my two announcements. Um for trading justice from Papa here using the products and being a customer can be useful you are right yep Uh, many ways to build conviction uh, with direct knowledge nothing beats your own experience Uh, yeah for sure Um, I am a believer in um, that kind of Peter Lynch methodology to some degree about just looking at the world around you and being able to be a believer in the companies that you use their products and that you have good experiences with. Um, so yeah, uh, totally, totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah, I know they have a, they have a ton of followers. So I, I, I don't know. I'm trying to get in touch with. Uh, a couple people here to see if not only if T3 can get them shut down, but if we can actually take over the account because they somehow got a boatload of followers in a really short period of time for uh, scammers. Um, all right, gang, I'm going to end the meeting here. It's five o'clock. What a day. I feel like I'm losing my voice. I'm going to get a beer. I think it's well deserved. Enjoy your night, everybody. See you tomorrow.